putting together uh, diagnostic algorithms and how we do this and how we think about validating them. And uh, thank you, Valerie. had seven fever episodes and received antibiotic at each occasion except once. And this is really has changed completely in Tanzania. When we were working three years ago, it was 70% of children who would get antibiotic, and nowadays it's 95%. So we know the consequences of all these. The factors are many about the health system. We have talked a lot about diagnostics, and what I would like to talk right now is about the decision-making tools around these diagnostics. There is a revolution going on in, in health. Everything is being becoming e-health or digital health. You see 12 areas of health that have been identified uh, in this topic, and we are working in these three areas, sensor, point of care diagnostics, data collection and reporting, and these electronic decision support systems. So what are they exactly, these uh, systems? In fact, they are new or not. The times have passed when a single human mind could even pretend to know all that might be useful in aiding patient. Uh, was written by Payne in The Lancet, but this was in 1964 already. So you see we have been thinking about computers and algorithms for a long time, but it didn't come in health really before recently. And the most advanced system is the Dr. Watson of IBM that is helping um, physicians to make accurate diagnosis in a certain uh, group of cancer using all genetic information, pathophysiological information, etc. So what is available on the market if I type on the Play Store symptom checkers? Because this is how it's called for patients. And you see that there are many available to make your own diagnosis either at home or to help clinician. So I took the three most uh, renowned ones, the first one that is called Babylon, and I enter basically, I play with that, uh, putting my patient cases, my family when they are sick. So this is what I did when my daughter, who is 18 years old, was sick uh, with fever last time in Tanzania. So I enter her case in, in Babylon, and what I get as a result, so she had fever, um, and she vomited once. She had a bit of myalgia for uh, a few hours. But the vomiting was a bit uh, worrying. And this is what comes out if I enter her symptoms in Babylon. Your daughter has either mig migraine, headache, or flu. And you should run to the GP. Well, in fact, for flu, you should stay at home. You do, should do exactly the contrary. I enter exactly the same case in Ada. And this is what I get, five possible diagnoses with completely conflicting instructions. So first, Ada is telling me, this could be flu, stay at home. But this could be rickettsia, go to see the GP. But still, it could be viral meningitis, you have to run to the emergency department. So what should I do at the end of the day? And for Isabel, this is the long list of diagnoses that you get as a patient. So it includes everything basically that can make fever. So I don't know what is the purpose be beyond making, making patients nervous and thinking about Lyme disease and et cetera. So not very useful. There is in fact uh, a lot of controversy around Babylon because Babylon has signed a huge contract with the NIH, NHS system in uh, UK where basically when you are in the NHS system, you are supposed to use this app before the, uh, deciding to go to see your GP. And what they claim is that we are one of the safest primary care provider in UK. Okay. 
Well, but in the meantime, doctors got a bit interested in this app and said, but what is going on here? And they entered cases, for example, men of 65 years of age that is smoking and has some dyspnea with um, sweating. And infarctus is not coming out, heart attack. While there is a, an advertisement on the H NHS that if you have these kind of symptoms, you should immediately go to emergency uh, department. So they put complaints because several of these very important diagnoses were not coming out with the app. So what did Babylon respond in the newspaper? Some would like to see us fail and use anonymous and wrong allegations. Some even pretend to be physicians. In fact, they were physicians. So it went back to still uh, the NHS became a bit worried and said, okay, let's have the UK Care Quality Commission to check what is going on. And they made an evaluation, big report, saying that Babylon was probably not safe in some areas. But the report that they put out was censored by the High Court on request of Babylon. It went on, the ping pong, Babylon technology wanted to defend themselves, so they said, we will certify ourselves as a medical device, class one. But in fact, this type of technology should be class 2B because you make a diagnosis. And with class one, the good thing is that you escape all validation studies. You don't need to, to show that you do not harm the patient. So it went on with Scientists coming in after physicians, let her do the BMG, but could please Babylon provide some evidence? Because this was really the big point. No evidence, no transparency, nothing known about the content of the algorithm. So Babylon said, okay, we'll do a bit of research. So they took 50 case scenarios well selected to make their tool work well, and they compared it with some GPs, and they claimed Babylon do better diagnoses than human beings. So it went back, scientists analyzed a study that was not peer reviewed, not published, because there were serious methodological problems. It is a very weak study. And this goes on, and you can read about what is going on with Babylon every uh, week in the newspapers. But the big problem is that in the meantime, even if NHS has suspended and blocked the app, 2.5 million in UK, Rwanda, and Ireland are presently using Babylon to diagnose themselves instead, maybe, of going to the GP. So this is what is really going on right now. It's a serious thing. It's because digital health right now is led by digital people, and health people are not involved enough. So this type of symptom checker are part of a group that are called electronic differential diagnosis generators that give this sort of list of diagnoses with a sort of probability based on hypotheses. We also have the score calculator that we know well from a long time ago. All these systems generally, um, they, sorry, um, I can show you here. They tackle one problem, either prevention or early triaging or diagnosis or uh, treatment, but they rarely combine uh, the different aspect together. And the big problem is diagnosis and treatment really go hand in hand. You cannot separate uh, one from the other for the following reason. I hope this works. So how are we supposed to think about treatment? What a clinician is supposed to do is evaluate the probability of, of a certain diagnosis. And then to say, okay, is this probability below a certain threshold, the test threshold, that means I can exclude the diagnosis. If the probability is above a certain threshold, maybe 50% for pneumonia, then the diagnosis is established, I have to treat my patient. And if the probability falls in between, I have to continue to test. But what people uh, sometimes forget is that these thresholds are different from one disease to the other. And this is the big problem for this algorithm. They apply the same threshold for all diseases. While for malaria, we have to be on the safe side. There are also cultural uh, factors here. There has been 
some studies looking at what physicians decide that are the threshold, and you can imagine in the United States these thresholds are much lower than in Europe, for example, and we don't know at all what Africa is thinking. So this is to show that this algorithm should always include the treatment part and not only the diagnosis. So how do we develop this algorithm? We first have to define a target user, what, for example, Babylon is not doing at all. They pretend to cover any patient with any condition with any medical complaint. So we say, let's be a bit more modest. We will focus on children two months to five years with a history of fever or high temperature. And then we have to also define the user. It's not the same to develop an, an algorithm for physician at the hospital or for community health worker, obviously. From there, we do extensive literature reviews. This was done for the latest uh, algorithm epoch, 12,000 uh, articles to see what is really coming out from the evidence from both northern countries and southern countries. Then the next step is to calculate the pretest probability, that means the prevalence of diseases based on etiology of fever study. This is another useful uh, data that we get from etiology of fever studies, this pretest probability. After the pretest, we need to apply our clinical predictors. So we combine them using CART analysis. This I have learned uh, with Kevin Kane, who was using this type of approach for combining biomarkers. So we do the same, but with clinical feature. And for typhoid, where we lack a test, we try to see how we could combine them best, and we can push the um, model for higher sensitivity or higher specificity according to our needs. We also work on uh, biomarkers with uh, Kevin Kane, and we found out that for pneumonia, it's not perfect, but uh, uh, end point pneumonia on chest X-ray, so that still does not mean that it's bacterial, but it's uh, clear inflammation or, or condensation. The CRP was not thing, doing quite a good job with C3L1. So that's why we decided to include CRP in our algorithm for uh, deciding about antibiotics in pneumonia. And from all these elements, we construct the algorithm that become a bit difficult to read, obviously. This is the simplest one we have for just a community health worker to decide if the child can stay at the village or should be sent to a health center in Tanzania. So for the health facility level, they are uh, a bit more complex. So what are existing right now for managing febrile children. We did a systematic review of existing tools, and we have four categories. First, we have the ICCM-based tool, in, in Integrated Community Case Management, so the IMCI version for the community level. And here we have three groups that have created an algorithm. Two of them have integrated the malaria RDT. For one, we don't really know. And then you see if they have done uh, what type of studies. So we have the clinical efficacy studies, really looking at patient outcome, is it safe? More clinical effectiveness, impact study, the qualitative assessment we have just heard about. And I mentioned here what and where they are implemented. We have also IMCI-based tool. The problem here is that the algorithm content is uh, mentioned but never published. And in fact, it's not just putting the paper version of WHO in an electronic system. It's not so simple. There is a lot of room for interpretation because some branches of the IMCI do not go anywhere. And when you have an electronic algorithm, you need to finalize all the possibilities, all the possible combination. So this should be really a requirement that these tools publish the algorithm content they are using because they are certainly, all of them, slightly different. None of them have been assessed in a clinical efficacy uh, study, and for some of them, effectiveness is going on with qualitative studies also. And you see that they start to be used in some country, mainly at small scale, except for the wreck of Terre des Hommes in Burkina Faso that have managed to implement this <laughs> electronic IMCI already in eight districts. They really did a fantastic job. It's just impressive. 
And we have then the Almanac-based tool. So for those who have heard of this, this is a, an, an algorithm that we had developed, our sort of first generation algorithm based uh, on IMCI, except that we had changed the threshold for the respiratory rate for pneumonia and that we had added a urine dipstick and a typhoid test, as you can see here. And this is presently implemented by ICRC in uh, Afghanistan and Nigeria at small scale. MSF um, has hired Clotilde Rambeau, who was uh, in our group when she developed Almanac. She is the one who developed it. And she then adapted it with MSF for uh, their needs. So it has become quite different from the original Almanac, but the principle is still uh, there. So they have done some, of, some work for um, validation but this is not published yet, and it is implemented in Central African Republic, Niger, and Tanzania, Mali. Oh, that's... Okay, I thought I had half an hour, but no. Okay. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. And then uh, we have the novel content-based tool, the MedSync, that has not published the content for... Um, Protection, it's a private company and they don't want anybody to know what is in algorithm. Even the health worker that are using it are not allowed to know, which is, I think, ethically uh, not correct. So EPOC is uh, the algorithm I will show you now. It's a sort of second generation of after Almanac. So what we try to do is really to follow this cycle of validation where we first have to lab validate the algorithm. So when I say lab, it's the IT lab and have a, a user-friendly software, which is a huge challenge. And then we go along the cycle, clinical safety, effectiveness, etc., taking into account always the clinical and epidemiological context doing qualitative research. So we did that for Almanac, and in the effectiveness study, we realized a lot of problems. So we went back in the cycle of validation to modify it quite drastically and came with the second generation epoch algorithm that we have validated in a safety study. So what is epoch is the, the tablet with the algorithm where we uh, have added severity tests while waiting for the one of Kevin K. So as soon as you have it, we take that all out. <laughs> <laughs> that means the oximeter, the glucometer, hemoglobin, etc., because these are predictors of bacterial disease, of serious disease, of a need to be referred to the hospital. And then for pneumonia, as I said, we use CRP more than 80 to give antibiotic, and for unspecific fever, we were using the PCT uh, with a threshold of two. And based on that, recommendation for treatment or admission. So you see that the oximeter is directly plugged in the tablet, so the result is feeding the algorithm. Um, this is an older child, and we did this randomized trial with more than 3,700 children. So one arm was routine, no tablet at all. One was the al almanac algorithm and comparing it to epoch, looking at clinical outcome of patient. That means we followed them up closely at day three, day seven, day 30 to look at complication. And you have seen already this morning the clinical failures that improved. We had not expected that. It was a non-inferiority study, but we did better probably targeting still the right antibiotic to the right patient at the right dose, etc. So at the scale of Tanzania, this could still represent one million clinical failure averted per year. And at the same time that clinical outcome was improved, we drastically decreased the antibiotic prescriptions from 95% to 30% with Almanac. This is also the rate that we get usually with IMCI, to 11% with EPOCT, which is the roughly the rate of bacterial disease we have presently in uh, that area, around 10%. And we also could shift antibiotics from viral pneumonia to the more severe children, thanks to this uh, point of care uh, severity tools, let's say. So this could represent 20 million unnecessary antibiotics saved per year in Tanzania if clinicians would apply strictly the algorithm, obviously. So now the next step 
is to go for more impact clinical effectiveness. And we are starting now a new project called Dynamic, where we will basically extend the medical content of EPOCT to uh, neonates, older children, and beyond fever to include any acute complaint. We are developing a new software because nothing on the market is really uh, satisfactory, so we hope to have something like a DHIS2 platform, but for countries to be able to program their own algorithm themselves and to better connect to uh, the biosensors. We will implement that in 70 health facilities in two districts in Tanzania, one with high malaria transmission and the other one, Beya, where there is almost no malaria because of this problem of interference between CRP and malaria. We need to understand better. What, how the algorithm behaves there. So normally we should get about half a million children per year attending this health facility over two years. So this becomes quite a lot of data. So we have to apply good um, statistics and the new statistical way of handling data is machine learning. But this will allow us to understand pattern, detect, for example, villages where something strange is going out that we cannot detect ourselves with our basic statistics, to decide to do more investigation. Why are there suddenly children with abdominal tenderness in this village? Could that be typhoid? And then do some sort of surveillance. So the aim is to combine that with surveillance and epidemic detection, if possible to feed back this algorithm, the algorithm that can be uploaded in a new version quite easily. So what is the machine learning for? Basically, it's to compensate for the missing data. The one big problem we have with algorithm is because we follow a pattern, it means a lot of children are not asked for some features. How, how do you deal in your analysis with all this missing data? So machine learning, can help us to infer all this missing data. And it will also tell us what are the clinical prediction that works better, especially to improve our predictive capacity of diagnosis, obviously, but also resource conservation. For example, telling us, you are always asking parents if uh, there is abdominal pain. Useless, forget about this question, this is not helpful. So we hope also to gain time in the a physical examination and history taking by knowing that. Same for tests. The other use uh, of machine learning is to personalize the algorithm. That means taking into account geographical variation and individual variation. For example, what m is machine learning telling us about HIV positive children, for example? So this would allow to um, uh, change the algorithm in almost real time. We think that we have a cycle of about three months because we still want a human eye to check obviously these changes. We will never make any automated change. An ethical committee would probably never accept that for good reasons. So what we do, we analyze, we have still physician also in Tanzania thinking, okay, is what the machine learning proposing us makes sense from the clinical uh, point of view. If it's the case, we modify the algorithm. If not, we do not. And we always validate these changes. So that's why the design is first a step wedge during six months to validate epoch again in real condition. And from there, we start to take this subgroup of patients of interest. We randomize them on the tablet. That means the clinician will have for each child maybe two versions of the algorithm. He will know that. We will explain to him what are the changes. He will apply that algorithm and we follow up at day 28 to know if the change we have made is a beneficial change or not. So if it's good, we keep. If it's bad, we reject and we go for another possibility. And this allows us also in collaboration with uh, Sabine uh, Dietrich from FIND to test new rapid tests that could come in in the meantime. For example, you say, okay, let's put in the system the typhoid test that you know does not work very well. Does it have a clinical impact? Yes, we keep the test. No, we take it out. So we do also this qualitative research because we are obviously worried about what it really means to have a tablet to take management, to take care of a patient. 
So this is a qualitative study we did in the frame of the EIMCI implemented by Terre des Hommes in Burkina Faso. And we interviewed 20 uh, health workers from uh, infirmier to accoucheuse, etc. all the people using this tool. And what this accoucheuse was telling us is it increases knowledge. We were really worried that they will lose knowledge. In fact, she said, if you record in the rec, it's the same name of the tablet, you learn at the same time. If one day there is no tablet, problem of electricity, you will still be able to correctly manage the child because she would by heart know which was the next screen that would come if she had the tablet. It gives uh, self-confidence. Yes, it teaches us as you cannot retain everything in your head, but with the rec, it reminds you at any time. At any time, you have it in front of you and it allows you to master. It improves communication. People in the village notice that now clinicians ask us more questions on the child and they touch the child again. <laughs> that was a big thing. They do a physical examination again. And something a bit mysterious that the chief of the village was saying, uh, we were in the dark and now we are in the light. I don't know exactly what he meant by that, but I think he meant brings transparency because now clinicians obviously do not dare to make a long list of prescriptions when they know that somewhere is recorded in the tablet what they were supposed to prescribe. And Terre des Hommes did that in a very nice way because they never brought the idea that there was a sort of policeman or control, but rather, you know, self-auditing, self-improvement of the quality of care. And people really took it very positively. And it changed the power balance like our philosopher in Lausanne are saying each technological innovation is double-sided, not due to the good and bad way of using it, but to the change in the distribution of power. It removes power from some, in this case physician, to give it to others, patients, changing the reality for all. And this is probably what explains why it has taken so much time for this algorithm to come in medicine, because doctors are a bit afraid to lose power, I think. Anyway, it brings back pride and autonomy. That was at least the feeling we got from uh, this team in Burkina Faso. Thank you very much.